Angie. I'm just going to jump right into it. Thanks for that great intro. There we go. Um, so I hope that I will help everyone gain some well-informed perspective on optimizing male hormonal health. I feel like men don't really get enough attention when we're talking about hormones. Um, and today we're going to recover we're going to cover the role of testosterone, estradiol, and progesterone in men's health. We'll talk about andropause, which involves declining testosterone and metabolic changes with age. I'll go over how to naturally support testosterone production and optimize hormone metabolism. And we'll separate the myths from the truths about the risks and benefits of testosterone replacement. And we also excitingly have the results of a new large trial on testosterone safety to discuss um, involving uh, the cardiovascular effects. Testosterone is made from cholesterol. The pituitary releases luteinizing hormone, which stimulates the Leydig cells in the testes to produce testosterone. Testosterone supports many aspects of men's health, including reproductive function, muscles, bone density, and low levels that are common in aging males can increase vulnerability to bone fractures. On the other hand, excessive doses of testosterone supplementation can lead to polycythemia. Testosterone can sharpen thinking, regulate mood and libido, and it supports confidence and energy. It can help burn fat more efficiently, and declining levels can lead to more body fat accumulation. And we'll discuss its role in heart health um, a little later on. Similar to the menopausal hormone transition, men also experience hormonal changes with age. They see a decline in testosterone and other androgens around age 30. And hormonal decline for men begins earlier, and it's more gradual than the hormone changes for menopausal women. And we call this andropause. From age 30, testosterone is dropping about 1.5% per year. Bioavailable testosterone declines more steeply at 2 to 3% yearly. And contributing factors include sex hormone binding globulin increasing, decreasing luteinizing hormone, and decreasing Leydig cell activity. And as far as the prevalence of low testosterone, it depends on the age of the reference population you're looking at and the cutoff values you choose. Anywhere from 12 to 39% of men over 40 have low testosterone. And don't forget to consider um, still helping patients that don't make the cutoff for low testosterone, but still have symptoms of hypogonadism. The proportion of men with low testosterone goes up with each decade, reaching 49% in men over 80, and an even higher proportion of men with obesity and diabetes have low T. Testosterone is fat soluble, so it needs a carrier protein in order to travel in water-based serum. And only 2% of testosterone exists as free testosterone. The rest is going to be bound to sex hormone binding globulin or albumin. Only the free testosterone is biologically active and available to bind to receptors. Sex hormone binding globulin has a strong affinity for testosterone. This binding globulin increases with age and then the amount of free testosterone is decreasing. But why is the binding globulin increasing with age? The main culprit is the enzyme aromatase, which irreversibly converts testosterone to estradiol. Estradiol drives up production of sex hormone binding globulin, which prefers to bind to testosterone, leaving less available for the tissues. This is encouraging more body fat gain, where there's a high level of aromatase activity. And to interrupt this cycle, a common approach would be to directly increase the testosterone. And also, estradiol suppresses gonadotropin-releasing hormone. This reduces pituitary secretion of luteinizing hormone, which lessens testosterone output. And that's the problem with body fat accumulation with age. More aromatization of testosterone to estradiol in the adipose tissue is resulting in less testosterone output. These additional factors can contribute to declining testosterone levels, stress, illness, poor diet, environmental exposures, and polypharmacy. Also, uh, cyclists who suffer repeated trauma to the testicles, studies have indicated that they might have decreased testosterone production. And a few things they can do to reduce that trauma are using a no-nose saddle, so a bike seat that has no front on it, 
um, standing on the pedals every few minutes, and also recumbent bicycling. As for the signs of low T, most people think of erectile dysfunction and low libido, but hormone decline in men also presents with lack of motivation, loss of muscle mass, reduced mental agility, night sweats, feeling burnt out. And low T has serious sequelae, including some of the most prevalent health conditions, insulin resistance, hypertension, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and depression. And a meta-analysis of 12 studies concluded that low testosterone has been linked to increased mortality and risk of cardiovascular-related death. And this is how testosterone um, decline contributes to insulin resistance. Low T is increasing adipose tissue formation. The adipose tissue in the abdomen is more insulin resistant. And then leptin produced by the adipose tissue can reduce testosterone production. And then obesity causes reduction in luteinizing hormone, leading also to lower testosterone production. Replacing testosterone to achieve normal values improves body composition and improves insulin sensitivity. These effects are even more prominent when TRT is combined with exercise. Men with metabolic syndrome are twice as likely to have erectile dysfunction as men without. And patients with erectile dysfunction are lucky because they tend to seek out treatment, which could lead to the discovery of metabolic syndrome and cardiovascular disease, and treating that could be life-saving. Low testosterone often presents with excess belly fat which is part of a condition called metabolic syndrome. This is defined as having central obesity plus two of these four factors, increased fasting glucose, high triglycerides, low HDL, um, and hypertension. Low testosterone undoubtedly contributes to metabolic syndrome, but it's not yet included in the criteria. Metabolic syndrome increases serious health risks like stroke, heart attack, and type 2 diabetes. Besides metformin and insulin, glucose control can be improved by testosterone, and this has been used as a treatment in Europe since 1939. In fact, it's been shown that testosterone works better for facilitating transport of glucose and nutrients than any prescription drug. Osteoporosis is another issue for our mature male patients. Up to one in four men over 50 will break a bone due to osteoporosis, and by age 65, men are losing bone mass at the same rate as women. Testosterone replacement can help prevent or slow bone loss for men. Low T is also linked to depression, and replacing testosterone in hypogonadal men significantly improves cognitive function, depression, and quality of life. But falling testosterone levels are only part of the picture, with andropause, estrogen, adrenal and thyroid hormones and neurotransmitter levels change too, dramatically impacting health. A thorough workup for your male patients would include screening for these changes. All men are producing small amounts of estrogen and progesterone, and increasing aromatization with age leads to estrogen dominance in men. The late Dr. John Lee coined this term for when the influence of estrogen overshadows that of other hormones, especially progesterone. Prostate cells are influenced by estrogen, which has proliferative effects. This promotes cell size, a uh, cell size increase and increase in number of cells. And while estrogen is important for bone health and sexual function in men, too much contributes to prostate enlargement involving lower urinary tract symptoms, and it may make men more vulnerable to developing prostate cancer. Progesterone receptors are found all over the body in the pituitary the testes, the male mammary tissue, and the prostate. In males, progesterone is important for a number of reasons. It promotes the health of the cardiovascular system, the nervous system, and the brain. It's osteoblastic, improving bone density. It helps mitigate the proliferative effects of estrogen, which is really important for the prostate. And in fact, that same Dr. John Lee wrote that there are numerous case reports of progesterone supplementation leading to improvement of benign prostatic hyperplasia. Here I'm summing up the research of the effects of progesterone on prostate health. The progesterone receptors in the prostate suppress the development of BPH. They prevent differentiation of prostate cells into cancer-associated fibroblasts, and they inhibit tumor-promoting cytokine secretion. 
Prostate cancer is the leading cause of cancer in males. One in eight men will be diagnosed in their lifetime, and it's the second leading cause of cancer death in men. Dr. John Lee researched the benefits of testosterone in males, specifically in relation to prostate health, and he wrote that progesterone and testosterone activate the protector gene P53, which prevents proliferation of prostate cancer cells in vitro, and progesterone inhibits 5-alpha reductase, which lowers DHT levels. DHT stimulates proliferation of prostate cells. And according to Dr. John Lee, estrogen dominance activates the oncogene BCL2, and this is among the metabolic imbalances that can contribute to the development of prostate cancer. Dr. Lee stated that the optimal saliva progesterone level should be 200 to 300 times that of the estradiol. So what can we do for our male patients? We can test their hormones and treat the imbalances that we find. The salivary comprehensive hormone panel can reveal whether your male patients have low androgens, if there's estrogen dominance, or if HPA axis dysfunction is present. And saliva is ideal for measuring sex hormones for a number of reasons. It is representative of tissue levels. It correlates more to the clinical presentation than serum testing because it measures the biologically active portion. It's the best choice to monitor topical hormones because they don't show up in serum unless the dose is really high. And saliva is painless to collect, it's cost-effective, and you can diagnose, treat, and monitor treatment all with saliva testing. As far as what to test, for a holistic approach, meaning treating the whole per person, consider testing all of these markers I listed, salivary sex hormones, um, and then serum testing for thyroid, sex hormone binding globulin, PSA, lipids, hemoglobin A1C. Um, as far as urine testing, it's really good to look at aromatase activity, 5-alpha reductase activity, and estrogen metabolism, and also abundance of androgens. This will help identify imbalances and drive your treatment approach. And so to assess hormone metabolism conversion and detoxification, you can order urinary metabolite testing. DDI's test is called the HUMAP and includes over 50 analytes. This is just the androgens neighborhood. Here you can look at aromatase activity, which converts androgens to estrogens, and you can also assess 5-alpha um, reductase, which makes DHT. DHT elevation can be associated with pathologic prostate growth, scalp hair loss, and adult acne. And this is page two of the HUMAP report for a male in his 60s. This shows you all of his hormones on the steroidogenic cascade with colors to represent their results. If you look on the top left, let's see if I can show you here. So all of his progesterone metabolites are low. Dark blue represents low. The catecholamines here, so the hydroxyestrogens are high, um, which we don't like. And then also all of the androgens tend to be low. I found that he had too much 5-alpha reductase activity and too much CYP19A1, which is aromatase, too much aromatase activity. These are all contributing to his symptoms, which include erectile dysfunction and BPH. And there are many lifestyle changes, herbs, and supplements that can help optimize testosterone secretion and metabolism. And so here I've highlighted things that increase uh, aromatase activity, decrease aromatase activity, same thing with 5-alpha reductase. Uh, common strategies in general would be balancing blood sugar, exercising, minimizing alcohol, taking zinc, nettle root, saw palmetto, and pygeum. Back to the catechol estrogens. These are the hydroxyestrogens that have gone through phase one detoxification. Generally, 2-hydroxylation is safer and 4-hydroxylation is riskier, and this is also the case in the prostate. Um, here I have a study where a line of benign prostatic hyperplasia cells were exposed to 4-hydroxyestradiol, and they transformed into cancer cells more so than cells exposed to 2-hydroxyestradiol or just estradiol. Expression of the CYP1B1 enzyme that converts estrogens to 4-hydroxyestrogens has been shown to be increased in prostate cancer. Higher expression of 1B1 has been correlated with higher glycine scores, worse survival rates, and resistance to androgen deprivation therapy. So in conclusion, 4-hydroxyestrogens may affect prostate health and men's risk of prostate cancer. Now we're going to talk about testosterone therapy. 
physiologic testosterone replacement doesn't just help erectile dysfunction. It also improves body composition, promoting stronger bones, more muscle, and less fat. And it can help treat insulin resistance and depression. But does it increase risk of prostate cancer and cardiovascular disease? So for years, doctors were taught that high testosterone caused rapid prostate cancer growth. And giving testosterone is like pouring gasoline on the fire. Where did these ideas come from? This all study started with a study published in 1941 claiming that testosterone was the cause of prostate cancer. Dr. Morgan Taylor, a neurologist at Harvard, reviewed this study and discovered that the conclusion was based on a case study involving only one patient who received testosterone for two weeks. Dr. Morgan Taylor published his findings in 2006 and wrote this book, Testosterone for Life, and he continued reviewing the research and concluded that testosterone therapy does not increase prostate volume or PSA in healthy men. This is a retrospective analysis of 77 men with low T and normal PSA. And the conclusion is that a high prevalence of prostate cancer occurred in men with low testosterone levels despite normal PSA and digital rectal exams. Testosterone actually decreases as men age while 5-alpha reductase activity in the prostate increases, causing higher DHT levels and increase in prostate volume. Normal testosterone levels benefit the prostate. In this trial, 207 men who had low testosterone levels and sexual or urinary dysfunction were given physiologic doses of testosterone. Over 90% of them saw symptomatic improvement, and most participants experienced reduced PSA scores. In reality, prostate cancer risk depends on age, ethnicity, family history, and genetic variants. Regular early screening becomes more important with these factors, but besides early detection, there are also some preventive measures that may lower their risk. These are a few of the modifiable risk factors. Consuming dairy, alcohol, and red meat, having hypertension and high cholesterol are all associated with increased risk. Obesity and metabolic syndrome increase the likelihood of high-grade prostate cancer. And the way that estrogens are metabolized is also important, where 4-hydroxylation and 16-hydroxylation increase risk and 2-hydroxylation decrease risk. To conclude this section, a 2016 meta-analysis found that prostate cancer appears to be unrelated to endogenous testosterone levels. TRT for symptomatic hypogonadism does not appear to increase PSA nor the risk of prostate cancer development. And men treated with testosterone replacement therapy for hypogonadism did not have an increase in adverse prostate events, according to the new findings of the Traverse trial that just came out in 2023. This was a trial that involved 5,200 men um, who were even either given testosterone gel or placebo. Um, the trial's findings indicated that men with hypogonadism who were screened and monitored carefully using a structured protocol um, had low risk of prostate cancer or other prostate events. We'll talk more about that trial in the cardiovascular section because that was the main um, end point that they were looking at. The question of whether it's safe to prescribe testosterone after prostate cancer has been diagnosed is really hard to answer. I did receive that question before the um, before the webinar. And until more definitive data becomes available, clinicians wishing to treat their hypogonadal patients with localized prostate cancer with TRT should inform them of the lack of evidence regarding the safety of long-term treatment for the risk of prostate cancer progression. So now we're going to move on to the controversy involving testosterone and whether or not it has cardiovascular risk. This, um, kind of all comes from this 2013 study that was published in uh, Journal of American Medical Association. It made mainstream news because it was really shocking. They claimed that testosterone supplementation increased the risk of cardiovascular events. However, there were many problems with this study. After therapy, the men tested had an, an average testosterone level of 332, which is still low, though many of them didn't even have follow-up labs. They didn't follow estradiol. They didn't follow hematocrit. And it wasn't a, ra a randomized controlled trial. So it's really difficult to establish causation. And 
this study underwent two official corrections that really were not um, mentioned in the news. So a lot of people did not find out about this, but they misreported their results. Um, their results actually showed a 50% lower rate of adverse cardiovascular events in men receiving a testosterone prescription compared to untreated men. And so the conclusion that made the headlines was wrong. And this trial also had large data errors, including that nearly 10% of their all-male database were comprised of um, females. Similar issues uh, happened with this study by Finkel and others um, that claimed it found an increased cardiovascular risk with testosterone therapy, um, specifically increased risk of heart attack in men over 65 who were on testosterone. This trial had no control group. So they couldn't really report whether cardiovascular events differed between treated and untreated men. And testosterone levels were not monitored before and after therapy. It's also helpful no to note that in the U.S., the average age for a first heart attack is age 65, and that's the age of the men in this trial. Articles that refuted these concepts didn't make headlines. This study was in the Journal of the American Heart Association in 2013. TRT in men with hypogonadism improves obesity, type 2 diabetes, uh, MI risk, exercise capacity, and QT length. And a large retrospective um, National Institute of Health study found that physiologic doses of injectable testosterone was protective against heart attack in men with high risk. Here's another one. In 2014, a randomized double-blind controlled trial concluded that men with testosterone levels in the mid to upper range have reduced cardiovascular events and mortality compared to those in the low range or high range. Numerous other studies support the cardiovascular benefits of testosterone or the lack of risk. This 2018 article concluded no randomized controlled trial where testosterone has been replaced to the normal healthy range has reported a significant benefit or adverse effect on major adverse cardiovascular events, nor has any recent meta-analysis. Testosterone therapy does have side effects. Testosterone stimulates erythropoiesis to increase red blood cells, and it can lead to increased hemoglobin and hematocrit. You have to monitor these levels during treatment. About one in 10 men can develop polycythemia, and you really don't want to have highly viscous blood. This side effect, along with the controversial research, prompted warning labels on all testosterone products to include a possible increased risk of heart attacks and strokes in patients taking testosterone. Thankfully, we now have the results from the new Traverse trial, which just came out last year and was designed to test the cardiovascular safety of testosterone. And it was a randomized controlled trial involving 5,200 men with pre-existing cardiovascular disease or risk factors. And the Traverse trial concluded that testosterone gel did not increase the risk of MI, stroke, prostate cancer, or lower urinary tract symptoms. There were slight increases in the incidence of pulmonary embolism and atrial fibrillation. This trial was not perfect. It had a high rate of both treatment and placebo discontinuation, 61% for both groups. 18% of the participants were lost to follow-up, which is more than typically acceptable in drug trials. And the serum testosterone levels achieved for those on therapy were just barely in the target range, hovering around 350 for most of the trial. Although if I were to design a trial, I would have used saliva, which tends to better represent topical hormone usage. Some studies within the Traverse trial found small improvements in mood and libido, but not for erectile function. Testosterone therapy did correct and help prevent anemia, However, most participants on TRT, more participants on TRT developed bone fractures throughout the follow-up period. Um, 91 of them had bone fractures versus 64 in the placebo group. And the Traverse trial did not show an improvement in glycemic control or reversal of diabetes or prediabetes, unfortunately. For optimal results, TRT dosing mimics the free physiologic testosterone levels of a man in his sexual prime, ages 25 to 35. This is when most optimal levels of free testosterone occur. So it is possible that the Traverse trial did not achieve the testosterone levels of a 30-year-old of a man.
In the 20s and 30s, a young, healthy male is making about six to eight milligrams of testosterone per day, which doesn't sound like a lot, but is enough in most cases. There are many ways to deliver testosterone uh, when prescribing it. I would caution against using the older oral forms, which have been found to be liver toxic. Uh, and peak testosterone levels occur in the morning, so it's best to time any topical, sublingual, or nasal dose in the morning. Here's a chart comparing the various ways to deliver testosterone in the common regimens. Topical gels and creams often expose other household members to hormones. Patches can deliver a more steady dose but might irritate the skin. Nasal sprays. Um, are less likely to come into contact with other household members, but you have to administer them three times per day. And they may cause excessive testosterone levels in the brain, or at least they did so in rats. Injectable testosterone is a good option if there's a pregnant female in the household or a child, and I'll get to that in a few slides. To minimize appointments, uh, some patients like doing insertable pellets that are replaced every three months. But once you insert the pellet, you're stuck with that dose. Um, intramuscular testosterone undecanoate lasts longer than cypionate or enanthate. So it only needs to be injected every four weeks and then every 10 weeks. Patients can save money by doing their own injections. Um, Troche is the last option on this list. It may irritate the mouth. They taste bitter. And some of that testosterone is going to be swallowed, which might be toxic to the liver. Uh, here is how the um, IM testosterone is injected. You're looking for the gluteus medius muscle uh, located in the upper outer quadrant of the buttock. Make sure to avoid the superior gluteal arteries and sciatic nerve and alternate the injection site between left and right side. These are the instructions for the patients that come with the sub-Q um, Xyosted auto-injector. This can be an easier um, option for patients who can't draw up their own medication, and the abdomen is easier to reach than the gluteus for patients who maybe don't live with someone who can help them do their injections. Testosterone prescriptions can be compounded with other helpful ingredients, like chrysin, which has aromatase inhibition qualities. Progesterone also can be uh, considered for prostate protection because it can both uh, have mild aromatase inhibition effects and 5-alpha reductase inhibition. There are pre-made creams you can find that combine chrysin and progesterone to use alongside testosterone prescriptions, especially if your patient is on injectable. You can't mix the chrysin with that, so then you can do a topical cream alongside. As far as testosterone goes, consider using the lowest dose you need to achieve a clinical response. All testosterone gels contain an FDA warning on the label regarding transference because of the recognized problem of unintentional transfer of hormones to women and children. If there are kids in the home, I really think that injectable would be the safest option. Um, there are many documented cases. For example, a pair of twin girls were exposed to their father's testosterone gel prenatally and postnatally. And this resulted in virilization, specifically clitoromegaly and pubic hair, when they were born. And they had high testosterone levels that didn't return to normal until they moved to a house, a different house, when they were age three. And I really wonder what happened to the next family that moved into that house and if they ever figured out um, that they were probably being exposed to testosterone. That's why it's really important to take precautions if you're using topicals. So apply creams directly to the application site. Wash hands with hot soapy water afterwards. Think about turning the faucet on and off with your elbow so you're not touching the faucet handle with your testosterone cream hands. And any surfaces that come into contact with testosterone should be washed with hot soapy water. Uh, linens, sheets, towels, clothing can be a source of exposure. So make sure people on testosterone are putting their own clothes directly into the washer uh, in case someone else uh, is taking a turn doing the laundry. You don't want them to get exposed to the towels. And achieving adequate testosterone levels can improve a man's health, but excessive dosing can have serious implications and can be outright unsafe. Make sure you ask your patients about their fertility preference because testosterone supplementation, even physiologic doses, can decrease sperm production. And we'll talk about how to address that in a second. 
Um, exogenous testosterone suppresses testosterone production, and without enough intratesticular testosterone, sperm production is not occurring. Testosterone, both endogenous and exogenous, directly inhibits gonadotropin-releasing hormone and luteinizing hormone, which leads to a downregulation of testosterone production. It takes three months of TRT to suppress spermatogenesis, and the rates of azospermia caused by testosterone are around 70%. So any males desiring fertility should be avoiding testosterone supplementation. Um, and the big question is, can spermatogenesis recur after stopping long-term use of TRT? It can, but it takes anywhere from six months to two years. The good news is that there are potential alternatives to TRT when preserving fertility is a concern. In younger males, HCG is the preferred treatment for hypogonadism to try to preserve fertility. Testosterone should not be used unless there is Leydig cell failure in younger men. HCG needs functioning Leydig cells. It works best when the luteinizing hormone is less than three. And additionally, HCG does not work as well as a monotherapy if baseline testosterone is starting below 300. The dose, uh, most common dose is 1,000 units twice a week, six weeks on, and then two weeks off because um, antibodies can develop with use. Some physicians will combine HCG and testosterone together to try to preserve spermatogenesis. Research supports that this works, but it's not guaranteed to work for everyone. HCG has some side effects like gynecomastia, acne, possibly blood clots, hypertension, and be sure to avoid HCG in patients with prostate cancer. Another non-hormonal option that will avoid suppression of testosterone is Clomid. It's a selective estrogen receptor modulator that works by increasing luteinizing hormone and FSH. This is an off-label use, and it's going to work best for men under age 55. When the testosterone levels are quite low, it can take longer to see benefits from Clomid compared to TRT. And side effects include decreased libido and a small risk for pulmonary embolism. Once treatment has started, uh, it's important to monitor therapy. We recommend checking labs um, before treatment and then at three months and um, annually. For patients prescribed pellets, injections, or topical patches, test midway between doses. For topical creams or gels, make sure to test 12 to 24 hours after the last dose. And you're going to want to include salivary testosterone, estradiol, progesterone, DHEA. Um, and then you're going to also test in blood a PSA, hematocrit or hemoglobin, glucose or hemoglobin A1C, and consider DRE. I also recommend using urine hormone metabolite testing three months into treatment to screen for excess aromatization and um, 5-alpha reductase activity. The next thing that's important, even if you are doing TRT, you still need to think about lifestyle because this is building the foundation for health. Um, and you want to think about these components, stress management, nutrition, exercise, sleep, water, uh, maintaining strong social connections. We can't all avoid stress, but chronic stress can lead to lower testosterone levels. We need to care for our nervous systems in order to modify our response to stress and reduce its toll on our bodies. Um, options could be mindful meditation, deep breathing exercises, forest bathing. And um, everyone wants to know what the best kind of exercise is to boost testosterone. And the real answer there would be any exercise that improves body composition, meaning it's reducing body, uh, body fat percentage and increases respiratory fitness. Any type of exercise that does that can improve testosterone levels and potentially erectile function. Um, all kinds of exercise increase testosterone in the short term, but levels normalize in about 30 minutes after the workout. It does take a long-term regimen to make changes to those baseline testosterone levels. Um, there was one small study on young men uh, that they... They had them do four sets of 10 weighted squats with a 90 second rest. And they showed that that increased the testosterone for 48 hours. 
So certain specific regimens may be more um, advantageous in increasing testosterone longer than others. Um, and then 200 minutes of aerobic exercise per week for six months was shown to increase testosterone, improve sexual function, decrease body fat and waist circumference in men who were over 40 and had abdominal adiposity. Um, so it does take regular exercise and a good, a good amount of it to um, create the desired changes. That brings me to nutrition. This is essential to improving health during andropause or when trying to treat low testosterone. You want to aim to improve insulin sensitivity and treat metabolic syndrome. And the majority of this is advice is coming from the China study, which was the largest nutrition study ever conducted. Um, it is advised to decrease the sugar in the diet, increase healthy fats, think about combining whey protein with regular exercise to help build muscle. And then eggs are a great food because they contain HDL, cholesterol, and omega-3 fat, which supports testosterone levels. And then in older males, higher protein consumption is associated with lower sex hormone binding globulin than lower protein intake. So that's something to think about. And when we talk about diet, we also want to think about the health of the gut. Um, you've heard of the estrobilome. Now there's emerging research suggesting there's also a testobilome in the gut responsible for producing testosterone. Certain bacteria in the gut can synthesize this hormone. Um, they showed that fecal transfer from male mice to female mice led to increased testosterone levels in the female mice. Um, another study gave the probiotic l ruteri to older male mice, and those mice had improved testosterone levels at the end of the study. They're also doing a similar study in humans now, but the results are not out yet. Elderly men who had higher levels of firmicutes in their gut also had higher testosterone levels. Um, the best way to support the gut microbiome diversity and abundance is to eat a wide variety of plant foods and include adequate soluble fiber, avoid sugar, and processed foods. Another way to support testosterone levels is to give a hefty dose of DHEA, like 50 milligrams perhaps. DHEA is the precursor to testosterone, and if you're giving this hormone, you should make sure to monitor testosterone, estradiol, and DHEA uh, three months after starting it. Zinc is a great thing to include. It supports prostate health. It helps the pituitary promote testosterone production, suppresses aromatase, improves sperm count, motility, and morphology, which are important measures of male fertility. And the best food source for zinc is oysters. Pygium africanum bark has been shown to improve lower urinary tract symptoms in men with BPH. And it's anti-inflammatory and it inhibits 5-alpha reductase and also estrogen receptors. Tribulus terrestris has been shown to improve free testosterone and erectile function. And the mechanism involves supporting the nitric oxide pathway and increasing intracavernous pressure. One study used 250 milligrams three times per day and showed that that was helpful for erectile dysfunction. Next herb is horny goat weed, which got its name because of what the shepherds observed their goats doing after they ate this plant. Goat weed can increase testosterone production, and it's a mild PDE5 inhibitor, meaning it has a similar mechanism of action to medications like Viagra. Common dose range might be 50 to 250 milligrams. Saw palmetto can help prevent the conversion of testosterone to dihydrotestosterone. It's been shown in some trials to be as effective as finasteride without the loss of libido. 200 to 300 milligrams may be helpful for decreasing hair loss. Nettle root displaces testosterone from sex hormone binding globulin, meaning it's making more testosterone bioavailable, and it's also an aromatase inhibitor. Velvet bean is called lacuna. It contains L-DOPA, which is the precursor to dopamine, and dopamine is needed to enhance testosterone secretion in males. Lacuna has been shown to improve testosterone levels and sperm count in men with infertility. For men ages 45 to 55, shilajit for 90 days significantly increased total testosterone, free testosterone, and DHEAS compared to placebo. 
and the LH and FSH levels were maintained, indicating that there were no adverse effects on fertility. So this might be, uh, maybe you haven't heard of this one before, but it might be something to consider in men looking for a natural option. And so um, here, putting this all together, this is a list of treatment considerations that I might think about uh, to support men in andropause. I might start with 10 milligrams of transdermal testosterone compounded with 10 milligrams of progesterone and 50 milligrams of chrysin for its aromatase inhibition. Zinc is included for prostate and testicular testosterone production. Uh, I'm going to use ashwagandha and B complex to support the HPA axis because ashwagandha not only is an adaptogen, it also may help support normal testosterone levels. And then we're going to encourage dietary fiber to bind and eliminate excess hormones and maintain proper gut health. And then we're going to start with 20 minutes of weight bearing exercise three times per week. I will want to increase that, but I like to start with it a more easily achievable goal and then work from there. So we are at the end here. What do I want you to remember from this presentation? Low testosterone is really common and symptoms extend beyond sexual dysfunction. Make sure to check testosterone levels in men with metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance, and cardiovascular disease. Supplementation may be considered after establishing an insufficiency. Nutrition and lifestyle is also fundamental to treatment. Never leave those out. Um, testosterone has not been shown to cause prostate cancer. Low T is associated with cardiovascular disease, and replacement has been shown to has not been shown to increase cardiovascular risk. And men become estrogen dominant with increasing age, which promotes BPH and prostate cancer. And progesterone can be protective against the influences of estradiol. And the benefits of treating low androgen levels with testosterone therapy can substantially outweigh the risks, especially when you use physiologic dosing and proper monitoring is done. So now we have hopefully some time for questions. 